thank you all for coming today. I, I think we organized ourselves a little bit in most concrete, most abstract, perhaps. <laughs> um, I'm just going to play videos mostly. Um, so uh, a lot of my work is on death, on death induced by diseases, uh, but I'm taking a much larger perspective for this talk, which is kind of fun. Um, so today we're going to talk about why do we die and are zombies real? So, to start with the first, why do we die, and it has a little footnote because I'm going to restrain my remarks to why do we die from infectious disease, which is my area of research. So, uh, I work in disease ecology, which is a field that often people haven't heard about um, outside of biology or even inside of biology, uh, and we study the spread of infectious diseases in populations. So uh, this is humans, right, as well as uh, wildlife. So the, the disease-causing coral bleaching would be part of disease ecology. Ebola is part of disease ecology. Um, and just to start with a few terms that I'll be using throughout the talk um, that are kind of just standard in this field. So I'll be talking a lot about pathogens. This is just any disease-causing microorganism. So it could be a bacteria, a virus, a parasite. Um, hosts will actually take a back seat in this talk. We'll mostly be thinking about things from the point of view of the pathogen. We are the host, uh, the animal or the plants or even the microorganism that hosts the disease and is infected by the pathogen. And then lastly, I'm going to be talking about uh, work on evolution of virulence. So virulence is the harm that a disease causes to its host. And so when we're thinking about uh, death and why we die, we can think about this in terms of why pathogens cause such high rates of host death. So if we look in nature, there are actually many, many diseases that are not only lethal, but are lethal even at very small um, doses of our disease, um, or the disease can remain dormant in the environment for a long amount of time. And these diseases have huge implications for populations of both wildlife and, and humans, right? So, um, many of you might be familiar with um, chytrid in amphibians, which is causing rapid global declines in amphibian populations. White nose syndrome, likewise in bat populations in the US. Um, West Nile virus, so this is a case of a virus that um, can infect both uh, human and non-human species. And then my personally, personal favorite uh, um, virulent disease, which is a baculovirus that infects insects. So, Virulent pathogens are all around us, um, and this actually uh, poses a bit of a, a conundrum for disease ecology, uh, because a lot of our original theory predicted that diseases should not harm us at all. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in the first part of this talk, is basically why would diseases evolve to harm us. So I often think from the perspective of the pathogen, and by perspective I mean from the evolutionary perspective. So instead of thinking about uh, why hosts are susceptible to diseases or resistance, why would pathogens evolve to be a certain way? And, and pathogen, pathogen evolution is kind of a special case in a lot of ways. So first of all, pathogens often have a very short, whoops, generation time. This, this pointer is a <laughs> placebo. Um, so uh, for evolution, what matters is not linear time, it's generation time. And so pathogens reproduce very quickly. You might have seen some scary facts on, from the CDC on how quickly that bacteria is going to build up when you leave your food out of the fridge. Right? So many, many generations mean they can evolve very quickly. So this is evolution happening on a time scale, not just of our lives, but of a week or a month. Um, so it's, it's really important to think about. Um, and then hosts and pathogens are also a special case because each is the selective environment for the other. So the pathogens are responding um, to what their hosts are and what the hosts are doing to defend themselves. And then uh, vice versa, the hosts are, are evolving in response to the pathogens. So we have this sort of two-way interaction um, where each is responding to the other, which can also speed up how quickly things are changing. Um, and then lastly, the, the sort of feature of pathogens that is so different from uh, a lot of other organisms in biology is that our pathogens can't live outside of the host, but they must exploit the host in order to reproduce and survive, right? So they, they end up with this paradox where they are dependent on this host, so you would think they wouldn't want to harm us, right, because their fitness will be zero if we die, uh, but yet they have to use our um, our host bodies as resources, 
which means that they're, they're stuck in sort of a, a conundrum here that underlies a lot of the evolution of their owns. So to reframe our um, initial question a little bit, why do we die from infectious disease? Instead, why would a pathogen want to kill us? <laughs> and so we can think about there are actually a lot of good reasons that they would and would not want to kill us. So um, going back to this third important feature of host pathogen interactions, the pathogens can't live outside of the host but then they have to exploit that host. So I like to call this the gingerbread house paradox. This is not a real theory, I just like this name, right? So if you're living in a gingerbread house and the only thing you have to eat is gingerbread, you're gonna come into a problem pretty soon, right? So um, this is the, the setting and the evolutionary context for our pathogens. Also, side note, this is a life-size gingerbread house that was built by a fraternity in Texas. <laughs> so um, I don't know if they lived in it afterwards, right? So, um, so what do they do, right? You're living in this house. You need, you need something to eat. You need resources. And yet, it, it's going to be really bad for you if, if you consume that whole house really quickly. Um, so a lot of original theory in our field predicts that the best strategy for the pathogen is somewhere in the middle. So harm the host just enough, right? <laughs> so in your gingerbread house, right, you can eat the less essential bits, right, but leave the roof, right? Um, you also need to make sure your population grows enough for you to get to the next host. So alternatively, if you have another gingerbread house lined up down the street, you could actually eat your own house very quickly and then just move on to the next one. Same thing with pathogens, just go on to the next host. Um, but again, right, make sure that the host doesn't die before you leave that host, right? <laughs> so um, these two factors, right, um, predict that we should have the highest fitness for our pathogens. We, we often measure this as R0, which is something occasionally um, pops up in, in those sort of doomsday um, epidemic movies, so keep an, an ear out for it, right? But it's just a measure of evolutionary fitness, right? So higher is better for our pathogen. So we expect a peak somewhere in the middle, right? Not harming too much, not harming too little. Um, and yet, we have all these incredibly harmful pathogens, right? This used to be a caterpillar, right? That to me looks like maybe too, a little on the too much side of harm, right? So, um, so how does this happen? Uh, well, certain conditions can favor evolution of harmful pathogens more than others. So high host population density is probably uh, one of the biggest ones, right? Um, so unfortunately, this is um, the reason we're overusing antibiotics in a lot of um, agriculture, right, for raising animals. Because when you raise animals, like these chickens, at such a high population density, and even worse, they're very, very genetically similar, which is like the ideal situation for a pathogen. Um, so this, when you, when you get this scenario, right, disease will spread really quickly and disease will evolve to be more harmful. Um, anytime we have disease transmission in the environment, um, that also leads to um, favoring more harmful pathogens. Uh, the first name of this theory was actually the curse of the death of the pharaoh. It came from um, the original uh, Egyptologists who all died from entering um, King Tut's tomb. Uh, some people hypothesized that it was due to fungal spores that, that were able to just persist in the environment for such a long time. Um, so long-lived spores are supposed to be um, more harmful. And then lastly, disease transmission after death, right? So if you can still move on to the next host to be transmitted after your first host has died, you can kill that first host right away, not a problem. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a feature of many really terrible diseases, right? Like Ebola, we, we, this is showing one of the first um, vaccination trials of Ebola. We now have a vaccine for Ebola. Ebola is, is so virulent in part because it's transmitted not just um, from an infected person, but even after they die, right? So um, when families are, are taking care of them in their, in their funerals, they, they are susceptible to, um, to getting sick from this disease. So my research is actually on a specific type of this third category, disease transmission after death, and that's zombie diseases. So to answer the second question, yes, zombies are real. Um, a zombie disease is a pathogen that changes the behavior of a host. So they're not technically real movie theater zombies because their hosts are still alive, but the disease is in the driver's seat in their brain, right? So the disease is controlling the host's behavior. 
And it's doing it in a way that will favor the pathogen, not the host. So a lot of times these zombie diseases are transmitted after death. And so the zombie behavior, right, the, the behavior that's induced by the pathogen is the host goes to a location where it will then die and it'll be um, posed to transmit to the next uh, generation of hosts. So it'll, it'll be in a great place for the pathogen to get transmitted. So um, there are all sorts of zombie diseases. There are viruses, there are bacteria, there are parasites. Um, I brought just a few uh, examples. So um, this one is popular in my outreach efforts. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, a disease, let's see, I'm not sure I can manipulate the quiver with this. Yeah, Would you mind moving it to 244, please? 244? Yeah. This, this whole video is fascinating if you have time to go back to it. <laughs> so horsehair, uh, horsehair worms in crickets. So this is a cricket that's about to jump in a swimming pool. Not a natural behavior for a cricket. Uh-oh. More Sorry. videos on shrimp farm. <laughs> okay. So the cricket the has... Oh, no, no. Sorry. It. Can you... Mute, please. Uh, yeah, I, I had everything muted on the computer, but I guess it unmuted. Um, great, thank you. So that is the worm emerging from the cricket. <laughs> so um, why did the cricket jump, jump in the water? Crickets cannot swim. This is not a natural behavior. It jumped in the water because the, this parasite is controlling its brain, and the parasite does need to be in the water because its next larval stage uh, disperses to an aquatic host. So, um, this is a slow motion in a um, <laughs> petri dish. Um, so many times they'll have multiple worms here. Oh, these just get better. This is just the intro they get for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this is considered a zombie disease because the behavior of the host is controlled by the pathogen in a way that helps the pathogen and not the host. Okay, can you um, go to the next one? Thank you so much. Um, great, and then this should do next slide, maybe? Well, you want to do next slide? Uh, yes, please. Great, uh, back. Great, super. So, um, so that was a parasite, right, a multicellular um, parasite. Here we have perhaps one of the most famous zombie diseases, which is a fungus um, in uh, neotropical ants. This is a bullet ant, so a very large, very painful sting ant. Um, and it has been, let's see if this, the laser pointer doesn't work on the TV. I'm, I'm just trying to make the video go. Sorry, could you hit play again, please? <laughs> Oh, sorry. I, I thought I muted the whole computer. Um, uh, okay, so that's David Attenborough in the background. Um, he, he has better things to say about it than I do. But, um, so this ant has died. Uh, before dying, it has clamped down on this branch. It has chosen a branch positioned in the northwest direction, <laughs> which we still don't know why that would be favorable for the fungal spores. About um, 60 to 100 centimeters above the ground. So very specific behavior. And now, in the weeks to come, uh, this fungal spore is emerging from, uh, from the head of the ant, and it's going to rain spores down um, in the environment where other foraging ants um, will pick them up and then uh, repeat this behavior. And so we get transmission of, of the parasite. Um, I think that's the end. And then this last one, Oh, no, I guess I can't play that either. <laughs> um, can you mute, please, before we go? So I think he's cursing. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Oh, whoops. All right. So, um, yeah, before you hit play, that's all right. We'll just watch it a couple times. So, um, this is a caterpillar, a gypsy moth caterpillar. It's in a little two ounce salsa cup. Um, which is how we raise them in the lab. And it has been infected by this um, NPV, the virus that I study. And so uh, it's, it has died. It's hanging in what we call the, the candy cane of death shape because the sweet <laughs> pods are still stuck to the cup. Uh, and then when the top cup is tapped, all that liquid you saw emerging is all the virus. So by the time the host dies, the virus has liquefied its insides completely so that it's about 99% viral DNA by weight. So um, 
it has converted virtually all the cells in this caterpillar, except for the skin and hairs, into um, virus. And just to anticipate one of my frequently asked questions, no, it's not transmissible to humans. <laughs> it's not even <laughs> transmissible to other caterpillars. So it's very, very species specific. Um, so I, I study a similar one, uh, which is a disease of the caterpillars of the Gulf fritillary butterfly. And since I had a, um, a an audience outside of USD as well here. If anyone has passion flower, you see these butterflies or these caterpillars, mm -hmm. please send me an email. Um, we are collecting virus isolates from um, throughout California. These are uh, these blue ones have all actually recently recently been sequenced by um, one of my students. Has figured out full genome sequencing pretty much by herself this semester, which is excellent. Um, so um, yeah, if you have. Uh, have passion flower plants in your yard or you see butterflies, please let me know. We'd love to, to come collect some. So that's that's a side a side note. <laughs> so um, just to wrap up with our learning, learning objectives from the beginning, why do we die? Uh, because it's in the best interest of the pathogen to kill us. Right? <laughs> so, of, in, of infectious disease anyway, right? Um, are zombies real? Yes, they are real. <laughs> um, so obviously, um, I'm just talking about infectious disease here, right? And it, of course, infectious disease is not the only cause of death. So this is a, um, a graph showing the mortality rate due to infectious disease um, in the US over the 20th century. And so you can see it, it is rapidly um, declined due to um, advances in health technologies, right? So uh, development of, well, the first one is just uh, understanding germ theory and knowing to wash your hands. So I was actually a huge contributor. And then development of antibiotics, um, which are starting to not work now, so hopefully this won't go back up. <laughs> and then vaccines, which are still working well, so that's great. So you can see we have this huge peak due to Spanish flu. Um, so mortality rate has actually dropped due to, due, to, due to infectious diseases has actually dropped off quite rapidly. And yet we're still dying, right? <laughs> so I will leave that for a future, <laughs> future speaker. Um, and then I, I showed this plot and it made me think of one of my favorite comics ever. And I realized I'm never again gonna be in the ideal situation to use it. <laughs> so here's a, I'll just let you read that to yourselves. This is not a degree off, and Ryan is not going to talk about stamp collecting. <laughs> um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Well, hello. Um, thank you to the Humanities Center for uh, inviting the scientists to come and share our perspectives here. It's uh, a pleasure to be uh, invited. I've enjoyed the whole series, the ones that I've been able to make. So it's been a great reflection on the whole topic. Uh, today I thought I would start out with um, the chemical perspectives on death and dying, so looking at some definitions, and then I'm going to take you through one of our um, ideas and how that applies to our definition of life and death, and end with that, which should set up Brian uh, for his final talk. I hope, I hope I set it up. <laughs> so what is death and what is decay from a chemical perspective? So a classic one that people think about tends to be on forensics uh, chemistry and thinking about, well, something died, how did it happen? I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> but if you're interested in that part of chemistry, uh, this is a, a snapshot from a webinar that came out of the American Chemical Society at Halloween time, where they walk you through um, looking at death and how it happened and give you some case studies and you actually get to solve a murder through the one hour um, webinar if you're interested in that side of chemistry. But moving on to the things I wanted to share with you. Um, I thought I'd start with death and looking at how we came up with our definition of what is death. And I'm going to play in the biochemistry realm and in the chemistry realm today. So death, uh, we started defining this kind of legally in the 20s. And it came from a definition of what is homeostasis. And homeostasis is really another way of saying balance. Okay. And when we think of that in terms of a human as our organism of, of choice, we think of how we can um, maintain stability. We think of our body temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, maintaining that takes energy. We're continuously feeding ourselves um, and maintaining energy levels to allow us to have that stability. 
And so the first definition of death came from Canon in terms of when we lose the ability to integrate functions that allow us to maintain that balance. Then that would be a definition of death. And then building upon that, in 81, we had a President's Commission that actually was titled Defining Death because we needed a legal standard um, in terms of defining death. And they came up with the, um, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which is now accepted by all 50 states and the District of Columbia, in that it recognizes whole brain death is the irre irreversible cessation of all function of the entire brain as the legal standard of death. And so building upon that, a couple papers came out, and it's still being debated within the, um, the field, that death can be loss of function of the organism. And you can think of that in two ways. That can be loss of function of the cells, and that all of the cells of the organism die. Or it can be loss of, of the brain cells. And we define that in different ways. So you think of someone who's comatose. They are not able to use their neurological function to communicate with you in any meaningful way. But that is not death of those cells. And so we don't define them as dead. Then we have the um, uh, permanent vegetative state. That is, people can't communicate with you, but they're also not dead. Their biological functions still persist. And that tends to be where we have damage in our prefrontal cortex. And they can measure that through um, uh, different instrumentation and define it as such. And then finally, we get to the point of um, brain death. And that is when you have damage to your brain stem. And then you're no longer able to control some functions, such as breathing. And then you have medical intervention that allows you to be ventilated and therefore still alive. But the definition that came forward in terms of um, bringing these two together was that integrated function, and they had to get away from that. And that biological function and loss of it could not define death, because those who were brain dead were still biologically functioning. In fact, there have been women who have given birth in a brain dead state. And so we had to redefine that. And that's the conundrum that's going on within the uh, field, is how do you define that death? And then on top of that, uh, another one I found in the field, there's a 2017 paper that I read, looking at organ transplant. And if you want to transplant an organ, um, you can't do it really from a dead person, not a biologically dead person. We define that as you cannot breathe for two minutes, and you cannot have a pulse for five minutes. At that point, your cells have begun to burst. And the organs are no longer viable for transplantation. So if I declare you biologically dead, I cannot harvest your organs and potentially use them for other human beings. So instead, we use the brain dead definition in that you don't have the function of your brain stem. So then you can then be put under anesthesia and your organs can be harvested where they are still in their functioning states and do not undergo that damage. And so you can imagine how this can be a moral dilemma for some. But biomedically, it is the only viable option. If we go the route of allowing someone to be declared biologically dead, the only organ um, that we can transplant at that point is the kidney. All other organs are off the table. So there are some, some thoughts on biological definitions of death. If we look at decay, defining that, this one is probably a more happy topic. We all love to recycle, right? <laughs> Good. All right, so we're on to recycling now. Um, in terms of death, we think of um, breaking things down, so decomposition. And there are certain terms we associate with that. So in decomposition, we have multiple stages. So we think of physically coming apart. And that could be the simplicity of having rainwater wash over whatever is dead and leaching out or bringing out some of the nutrients or chemicals that then can be recycled into nature. And then we have the physical breakdown of it. So on the soils, you may have dug up some soil and find earthworms. And what they're doing is physically breaking up the matter that is in the soil. And as it comes out their, their backside, um, it's been broken down into smaller chemicals that can be recycled into something that can be built by another organism. And the same with maggots as they come to inhabit us as we um, decompose. It, they're just breaking us down. And what comes out of venom is a, is a more simplified molecule that can be used to build something more complex. And then we have, over here on the chemical side, we actually make use of, here's a handprint from an eight-year-old. So uh, Tasha Stern, who's at Cabrillo College in California, thought it would be interesting when her son came in from playing, she would lay his hand down onto a plate that allows bacteria to grow an agar plate and see what came of it. 
Man, I bet he washed his hands every night after that, right? <laughs> so this is just coming out from coming in from play and the bacterial growth there. But as bacteria grow and bring in nutrients, what they're doing is actually breaking down what they're living on in order to harvest those nutrients. And so that's part of this process of decomposition. And then fungi also help us out here. So you may not know, but the largest living organism is actually a fungi. It is in the forest floor. It is spread over several kilometers. Um, and is helping to degrade those leaf matter, et cetera, that have fallen down, taking that cellulose and breaking it into its um, uh, component structures for us to recycle. So humans go through the same process, of course, um, in that we go through uh, loss of blood flow, we clot, our blood goes to the lowest point of, uh, due to gravity, we go through rigor mortis, and then all the wonderful bacteria, that microbiome that's helping us digest and it's covering our complete bodies, helps to break us down further, and we get the oozing of cells opening up, and all of those chemicals come out, and then we have the inhabitation of um, different organisms, like maggots, helping us to break us down physically, and then we come apart down to our bones, and eventually, unless they'll calcify, those will also be broken down, depending on where we're interred. So we go through this process, too, of complete recycling. So I think of life as the ultimate recycling uh, venue in that we continue through this decomposition and then mineralization is to grab some of those things like iron and put them into the nutrient cycle and allow those to go through the process as well. And so we think of that, and one great example is the carbon cycle. In terms of grabbing CO2 from the atmosphere via plants and then fixing it into more complex molecules and then we eat those plants and then um, they become something more complex than animals and animals can build components of that and fix the, the CO2 there. And as they are then respiring, so every time you breathe out, you give off CO2, but also when you die, you eventually are broken down back into that CO2, so you complete that cycle. And plants that are not eaten can then be put into different components, coal, petroleum, different fossil fuels, as well as the carbonates into the ocean, which is a huge store of our CO2, and then that can become a limestone, which is then exposed over time. We see that in the sediments in some of our areas. So here's a great example of how we go through this process of decomposition. So what I wanted to talk about was that concept of homeostasis as part of death and that balance. And I wanted us to contemplate how humans do that. And I'm going to talk about it in terms of metabolism, because I love food. <laughs> food is good. So homeostasis, we think of it, I love teeter-totters as my visual aid and thinking of uh, homeostasis. So when I am homeostatic, I am balanced. I have equal <clears throat> amounts of things for inputs and outputs. But when things are altered, I have this imbalance, and I must be able to detect that. And I do so through things called receptors. And you might think of this as, hmm, I have a slide that I gave once at a hospital to convey to patients what I did in my research. And I used kind of the 911 system as describing how this works in that you have a situation. You pick up the phone and you call 911. And that receptor is that 911 operator who's going to put out the right message to the resources. So that's going to be my receptor is the operator. The control center is what she calls to send me aid. And then there's a response. The EMTs, the fire department, whoever is needed comes to the rescue and has an effect that then brings me back to that balanced state. Okay? That's one way to think of homeostasis. What we have to think about is not something as a solid number, it's not a single value that I want. Instead, I roam around in a space that allows me to be healthy. Okay? So I have boundaries, and if I get out of those boundaries, I become diseased. So you may think of blood glucose levels and diabetes is an example, where if your blood glucose levels are too high or too low, you are then out of balance, and then you enter a disease state, which needs an intervention. And so that's an example of, of a homeostatic state you maintain. To do this, we have several things we need. Um, some of them we take for granted, like we tend to be under constant pressure. <laughs> I take that one for granted. Access to water and oxygen are other things that we have. And then we maintain body temperature. And the other one is nutrients. If we have all of these things as an organism, we can maintain that balance on the whole. And that we can do so in terms of then becoming a population that is able to do things, such as reproduce, develop, maintain growth, etc. So I wanted to focus in on nutrients today and how we take them in and how we utilize them and how that plays into this balance that we must maintain. 
So I love Mary Roach. She is a, a wonderful writer who takes you through biological circumstances in a very entertaining, but wow, a lot of detail. So in this one, she's going to take you through um, how you have food entering into your system all the way through the alimentary canal and out the other side in great detail. And that's just shown here in this cartoon where food enters in and then we must be able to process it, harvest nutrients, get rid of waste, and allow it to flow throughout our bodies to the correct places. So we do that by consuming a variety of foods. But you'll know that glucose is the main thing that you metabolize. At least that's where all of our meta metabolic pathways are built, to take energy from glucose. So carbs are good. Okay. Glucose is at the top. I have to share molecules. I, I am a chemist. So at the top, we have glucose. It's a six-membered, uh, six-carbon um, moiety up there, and it comes in all varieties of things that we consume. My favorite happens to be Rose's Donuts, but, you know, <laughs> variety is the spice of life, so I've shown you much more. And it goes through processes, metabolic pathways, which I'll share with you in a moment. And out the other end is that CO2 I told you that you breathe out as, as one of the waste products or the end product of your metabolism. And that coming off here, we can break things off and use them as building blocks in order to create things that we need as a, as a human host. So to do so, <laughs> nothing's for free, right? It always costs something. So our cost is paid for in ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And we can think of this as the energy currency of the body. And we have to invest it into helping us break this down. But as we break it down, we get a little bit of replenishment. And then as I want to build things, I also have to invest it there. So one of the questions in terms of maintaining homeostasis in there for life is how can I do that? How can I balance the ability to harvest this energy and then um, direct it to different things I want to do in terms of building and breaking down more things in order to maintain this energy state. So we have different carbon skeletons that we maintain in our body. So this is the same one from the previous slide. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rip off this phosphate. Okay? And in doing so, after I've released it, that product has a, a lower energy. It allows me to harvest energy. So then I only have two left. So now I have two orange balls left. And then finally, I can rip off one more, and I have one. So these are the different forms that reside in your body. And it turns out that you have about 100 grams of that in your body. It's about the size of a stick of butter. It's distributed throughout. I don't recommend rubbing butter over you, but it's all throughout your body. Um, distributed. So that's what you have to work with. Would you be surprised to know that during the course of the day, you actually utilize 50 to 75 kilograms of that particular molecule to do the work that you need to maintain life. That's about 200 to 300 Big Macs. It was very fun to go look for, how do I describe what 50 and 75 kilograms looks like? I landed on Big Macs because I love pickles on sandwiches. <laughs> so that's where I am. So how do we do that? How do we get this? And it plays back into that concept of recycling. In that, you can think of ATP as sort of a battery and that we have some of it here and that we can utilize it. When breaking it down and lopping off one of those uh, orange balls or phosphate groups, I then can, in the stabilization of this moiety, gain energy. And in doing so, then of course I am depleting the charge of the battery. So therefore I must then um, do some respiration, some metabolism to build it back up. This is what I do to get that. I know, my biochemists, if they were here, they'd be like, Hey, Dr. Bell, I know that now, because we're just getting there. Um, but this is kind of a road map, and this is a fun one, because it's built off of a metro map. So you might <laughs> recognize it in terms of if you've been to uh, New York or uh, Chicago or D.C. This reminds me of the one from, from D.C. a little bit, where you have this kind of big main line coming down the center, and at the top you might see that glucose is up there. And that's where we start from. And we come down this big main line, and then over here, this is where I get to make ATP. But ATP is going to be one of the fuels that helps me do all of this other stuff. How I make my fats, how I make my DNA. Everything that I need to be a human being, I use ATP to make. So how do I maintain that balance? And how do I define that? Well, I thought this was a good analogy. Because the other one's sort of, you're like, holy smokes, you make biochemists do that. Don't worry, it's really easy once you get into it. So you think of airports 
And how do we get all those planes flying around the world? This is 24 hours of planes moving around the world. Can you imagine? You can't even see the U.S. It's just a yellow blob, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you think about what it takes to manipulate um, those airplanes to move at the right speeds, on the right time frames, in the right pattern, so that we don't have um, more catastrophes than we actually do experience. Then think about what happens if you do have a snowstorm in the northeast, a hurricane in the southeast. Maybe you have a La Nina event on the west coast. And how that bums up that ability to have that constant flow, delivering things wherever they need to be, such that then they can take off from there and move to another part of the world. And now you can begin to understand how our metabolism is very finely tuned in order to deliver things as needed, when needed, on the right time frame, at the right concentration. And that when those things are out of kilter or being blocked, that's when we get these disease states. It's when we get delays and cancellations. Okay? So that brings me back to how do I define life and death? So when I think about things that are balanced, or having flexibility and flux through a system, I can think about, well, they're not static. But if I look at them on average, they will be balanced. Or I may take a different approach to finding balance. I may have a lot of one thing, but on the other side of the equation, I can compensate by having multiple things contribute to bringing that back into balance. So if we think of the natural state of things, especially when we have an elephant playing teeter-totter with a kitten, <laughs> the natural balance of that would be that the elephant is going to be sitting on the ground and the cat will be in the air. And I can define that as the equilibrium of the unperturbed state. And I will call that the equilibrium constant, or KEQ. And as a chemist, I would define that as my delta G naught, or my delta G, I should say. My free energy is going to be equal to where the unperturbed state is, where I do no work. It's just where it naturally sits. And I'm going to reflect upon that. Also, what happens if I could perturb the state? What if I did some work? And if these two are equivalent to one another, they must be in the same state. And one has a negative sign in front of it, so if they are equal to one another, they will be zero. That is what I would define as death. When delta G is zero, the organism is dead. But if I apply work to it in order to bring it to a new balance that allows the inputs and outputs to be beneficial to the organism to survive and thrive, then I am in what is called steady state. And that is life. So in chemistry, I think of steady state as continuously having to do work. And I suspect that most of you feel like you're continuously having to do work, right? <laughs> do you ever feel like you totally get to relax? <laughs> All right. But when you are in that defined state, that, that unperturbed state, you are then at equilibrium. And so I often tell my students when we get to this part in biochemistry, then on my gravestone, I will have that I am at equilibrium, or my delta G will equal zero. So I want to end here with saying I hope your steady state is joyful and that you enter equilibrium peacefully. <laughs>
more alive. alive. This looks more alive. You probably can see this. These are you know cells growing and splitting, but actually you know this dead thing. Whoops, I don't know if I'm going to be able to replay movies. You also see droplets split and kind of divide, right? So division, cell division is a you know a property only of living things. All right, dead or alive? Alive. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a flocking behavior of these birds. Uh, well, you can get flock. Well, I guess I shouldn't give away the answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dead or alive? So this looks alive. You also get flocky behavior. You can get flocky behavior in very simple systems. These are just little plastic objects, you know, probably like kind of like this, but maybe shrunken by about a factor of ten, and just vibrated. Right? Something like a shaking table, and spontaneously those objects flock. Um, all right, dead or alive? Oh, <laughs> later it's going to be not so good. Yeah, this, this is, uh, these are dead. Um, this is actually just food coloring. If you get a piece of glass, um, get it very clean, which can be difficult. But if you get it clean enough and you just put food coloring on the slide, they'll kind of chase each other around, the droplets, right? Which looks a lot like this. Is this dead or alive? Alive. Yeah, it's kind of a classic picture of, um, of some white cell. So? Yeah? OK, chasing a bacteria. OK. Uh, this is very cool. This is recent work from a few years ago. Dead or alive? Dead. It is dead, yeah. But it looks very much just like the mm -hmm. cilia beating you know, in, a, in a cell. All right, and this, um, yeah, it's just a synthetic system. You just kind of put a couple ingredients together, and you get this spontaneous collective motion. All right. Uh, oh, this is a cool one. Um, wait, play. play. Oh, sorry. There's some red object. Is that red object dead or alive? So it's gonna solve that <laughs> maze. Can dead things solve mazes? Maybe. Yes, they can. This is dead. Actually, you can get soap to solve a maze. Um, if you put a drop of soap in a maze like this, if it has fluid in it, it will go to the end. And this has to do with surface tension, purely a physical effect. It takes a while to get to the end, but it, it gets there. Um, all right, so what physicists do, what a lot of physicists do, is try to create minimal systems which exhibit kind of complex behavior. And when a lot of physicists maybe biophysics specifically, are trying to create these minimal systems, very basic, stupid systems, which exhibit these kind of complex behavior, such as self-replication or division, like we saw oil droplets doing, uh, swarming or flocking. This is a big area of study. Just getting really, system, really simple systems to flock. Turns out you don't really need too much to see flocks or swarms emerge. Um, getting motility and being able to sense neighbors like we saw, we just you can get food coloring to chase each other around. Uh, synchronized oscillations that just happened through also just adding um, protein filaments and ATP. Actually, just put those together, you can get spontaneous oscillations forming. Ability to solve mazes, right? That's just done with uh, soap can do it, oil droplets can do it as well. All right, so. We study this, physicists, biophysicists study this uh, to kind of quantitatively understand mechanisms of living systems, of living matter, by building these artificial systems that exhibit some feature of a living system. All right, so this is kind of, well, generally I would say biophysicists do this a lot and in many different forms. So in my lab as a biophysicist, one thing that I do is build very simplified models of different things that uh, are featured or that are, are similar to living systems. So I know that a living cell, an actual cell, will be compartmentalized. I just build systems that are also compartmentalized in the simplest, stupidest way. Um, same with looking at DNA. We just study DNA kind of out of the cell in very simplified systems. Um, and then what kind of some work that we're, we've been doing recently is looking at these active particles. All right, so these are just little disks, little plastic disks, about four millimeters in diameter, placed on the surface of water. They just spontaneously, and we add some chemicals so that they do this, but once we do that, they just spontaneously start moving and breaking apart. 
Right, so this is um, kind of work done in this field of active materials. All right, so let me just give you some examples of active materials. And broadly, I can define it as, as some system of energy consuming units that then display some sort of complex behavior. So cells are an example of active matter. Within the cells, there's some active units, proteins, you might call them. <laughs> some sort of motors, protein motors that move around, cause some activity. Uh, bacterial colonies are an active matter, just made of individual units that consume energy, cells, right? Uh, same with tissues, uh, organisms. Um, each, you know, you can think of this flock, this group, or swarm, as being composed of these energy-consuming constituent units which move around. And what's really interesting is that you get all sorts of collective motion when you have these active materials. Right? You get herds forming, flocks, swirls, I think this is, these are ants, you can't really see them, but they're ants. Um, people form, I don't know, what you would call it, herds, sort of <laughs> groups of people that move together. Uh, and actually, with humans, it's really cool. This is some recent work done a couple years ago. Um, anybody been to a mosh pit? <laughs> yes, yeah, metal pits over there. Um, so, mosh pits, kind of a, a, a great example of active matter. Um, individual <laughs> units that just collectively uh, or exhibit some sort of complex collective behavior and get kind of like swirling behavior. Um, this was actually the subject of a, of a scientific article <laughs> looking at the collective motion of humans in mosh pits and circle pits, which are related to mosh pits, but you go around in a circle. <laughs> All right. And what they looked at, so they, they analyzed videos that they just found on YouTube. You know, they searched for mosh pits, took those videos and analyzed them, tracked the speed of all the individuals. So they got the speed of every person in that mosh pit and then looked at the distribution of those velocities. Right, so this is saying that this is in units of meters per second, so some velocity here, some speed. Most people are going at you know, about one meters per second, kind of tails off. What's really interesting is that this behavior, this function, is the same function that you would get if you were to model the velocity of air molecules in this room. So it's something known as the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Okay, it doesn't really matter what it's called. But it just characterizes, characterizes how, how things are moving if, they're just, if there's some temperature, right? Just thermally, just passively moving. So it's really interesting that we see this inherently non-equilibrium system, which is the fancy way of saying some living system, but it exhibits characteristics that are the same as something that's not living, that's dead, right? The air molecules in this room. All right. And you see this um, kind of many different ways that uh, the collective behavior of living systems or of any active material kind of can be mapped onto dead things, kind of equilibrium character, equilibrium matter. All right, so one of the ways that, that scientists, that physicists particularly study active matter is to make very simplified uh, active materials. So instead of having to go to a bunch of um, metal shows, you can just make little synthetic swimmers by taking little plastic beads, so like micron-sized beads. And if you coat them, coat one side, they'll just spontaneously move around. All right, randomly, it'll be random motion, just kind of like the person in a mosh pit, random motion. But you throw a bunch of these randomly moving particles together, oh no, uh, Spencer, can you uh, play this for me? You, th you throw these randomly moving particles together, uh, yeah. and you'll start to get swarms form, or flocks. All right, and it's kind of not super visible here, but there's some, like, some groups that are denser than others. So this is just random particles, like particles moving randomly, completely randomly, but spontaneously they form flux. And if you play the right movie, if you kind of increase the density, um, you don't get so much flocking, but you kind of, well, there's a little bit of flocking. Uh, but then you get kind of some swirling, some vorticity occurring. Right? And again, that's just spontaneously forming. These are just randomly moving particles. So what, what physicists want to do is search for some sort of unifying principle that kind of unites all active 
material, whether it's people in a mosh pit or plastic particles or just some plastic uh, rods that are vibrated, because they all seem to exhibit this property that they swarm and flock. So what, what a physicist likes to look at is something like this, like a phase diagram or a state diagram that kind of characterizes the simple and reduces its complexity. So here I just have like density of particles, the range of particle-particle interaction, like how close two particles have to get before they feel each other. And you know, depending if it's really dense, then I might get a vortex forming. If it's not so dense, but still dense enough, I might get a swarm. Not so dense, a gas would just be like non-interacting. Okay, um, so it would be nice to kind of have this sort of diagram that would unite everything that's active, which would be you know, all of life, as well as <laughs> dead things that we can make active. Um, and so far, physicists have been pretty and we haven't been very good at, at doing this yet, so because most of what we've studied is equilibrium systems. Um, you know, systems like just regular matter that's not active, that's passive. Uh, so we have the phase diagram for, for some uh, material, like in this case water, at atmospheric pressure, low enough temperature, it's a solid. I heat it up, I get a liquid and then a gas. Right, what we really want to do is do this for non-equilibrium systems. And hopefully it kind of works for flocks of birds, random particles that are just vibrated, whatever we have. All right, so what can you do if you, if you have control over active matter? So it's not just study, like, kind of have these unifying and universal principles, but um, there's some kind of applications too. One is with uh, kind of Self-assembly, getting so, so another kind. I guess another example of active matter would be little robots, uh, and you can get if you just have like thousands of robots, which you can do now. You can get thousands of robots, and they they can just interact in very dumb ways, but still, if they just interact at all, you can get kind of emergent behavior, um, and that's kind of. Hopefully, well, people are kind of hoping that with that you can kind of assemble more complex machines. And this is just actually from this month's Nature Materials. There's a new, new work kind of showing that you can get with randomly moving little particles, they can self-assemble into something more complex. Um, but really, I think a lot of people are interested in these kind of active materials to study life um, and to understand like the physics of life. Because we see certain emergent properties um, that, you know, you might think of this flock as you kind of need some intelligence there, and like the, the birds have to somehow communicate to get this kind of type of behavior, but it turns out you don't. You can just take, you know, dead particles and shake them, and you will get flocks and swarms. Um, so it's still kind of in the early stages, actually, I'd say that physicists are working on this. Still, um, people are just trying to, to characterize and categorize different emergent behaviors like this. Uh, but it's, a, it's an exciting time, I think, in, in this physics of active materials. All right, thanks. Uh, is death a disease, as some optimists think, that someday can be prevented, or uh, it's an inevitable and inherent part of any life? I think the latter. For example, I, the both, side, uh, both sides of a chromosome, you know, mm -hmm. there are these like shoe lace tips and things like that. So maybe just, you know. You the fraying of those, that was going to be my example, right. is that our biology is only built to last so long. So if we wanted to be immortal, we would have to figure out how to renew that biology. How to remove, you know, for instance, the lens in your eye is made out of a protein that was in the womb of your mother. You never get to replace that. So then in, in older age, we tend to get cataracts because we've accumulated enough damage on that lens that now it begins to degrade. So we have cataract surgery. So if we can they figure out ways in which we can replenish these things that tend to wear out or are not replenished naturally by the processes that we can do, I don't know. I think there are many things that would have to be figured out in order to do that. But there are enough examples of things that tend to 
give out over time that are not repaired to the extent that they need to be, that we accumulate too many changes. Think about when you replicate your DNA. Mm -hmm. You have mutations incorporated. So we hope, on average, three mutations per replication, mm -hmm. okay? Sometimes more. Sometimes, maybe we're lucky, we got a perfect set once. But those accumulate over time. Are they detrimental? Are they silent? What role do they play? Do they make us more fit? So, lots of questions. So maybe not a complete answer for you, but things to think. More questions? Ryan, are you saying that this, so I guess I, I always assumed that more complex beings, right, humans and or birds, would, are doing this for some greater purpose because they need to do something for some reason. <laughs> and so, in, so are you saying that what they're doing is way more random than we thought? Uh, well, I guess, I mean, <clears throat> there probably is a reason that they're doing this, I guess, so sh but I don't care. Um, and so if you just had, yeah, biologists would care. Okay. But it, you, don't, you, don't need, you don't need them to have a purpose, and I guess they still will flock. Like, yeah, if I just took some beads and vibrated them, uh, I would just need them to, I guess, not be spherical beads. I would just, if I could have some elliptical particles and shook them, you could get some flocking. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I was fascinated by this. And it, it, still in my history of philosophy classes, I'll teach Epicurus and Democritus way back in, in the classical period. And their idea of the nature of the world was it's just a big void with an infinite number of tiny particles moving around at random sometimes coming together into more or less stable organisms and then separating again. Mm -hmm. how, how right were they? Yeah, that, that seems pretty right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think this, this work yeah, makes that kind of distinction between like living matter and non-living matter. You know, it's, it's more in our, I guess, we, we think of that as a big distinction that's maybe not so much correct. And this is connected with Crystal's point, because for, for them it was, it meant the whole of life was completely random. There was no divine purpose mm -hmm. or driving meaning for the universe. Do you want to venture some thoughts about the metaphysics? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. So wait, what, just, can you well, say that again? Two, there seemed to be two ideas that take it point. Things came together uh -huh. designedly. Uh, there was some kind of authorship involved in it, or it was random stuff. And of course, Darwin's sort of changed the, 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 the dynamic of that debate. But pre-Darwin, those were the two ideas. There was some point, some purpose, written into a, a being. And then the Epicurean view that it was mm -hmm. just something rather random. I mean, I just wonder whether, you, right, right. whether your research took you to one of those sides. Yeah, so, I mean, I think with as physicists look at systems like this, um, I mean, because like an early scientist, I guess, with Alan Turing, like looking at kind of pattern formation, right, and, and recognizing that that was just the chemical reaction, right, and that was kind of like the like chemical theory of life. Um, and now we're seeing maybe more of a, a physical theory of life that it's, um, you know, on another level, it is just through kind of physical interactions and nothing more complex that give rise to some of these emergent behaviors. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, sorry. it was kind of up and down. So do you know about um, some of the people who study, uh, here's one example, African architecture, and they fly over the villages in Africa and they look and the patterns that um, people think that they're just putting up these villages that actually, they probably fits some of the patterns mm -hmm. that you see. So do you ever look at um, different layers of this pattern? No, probably not. You have to be a sociologist. You just need to think of a team talk class. <laughs> 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 an anthropologist and yourself and a philosopher. You can decide whether 
it's mm -hmm. one whole system that's right, just all right. random, whether it's architecture, human behavior, or life or inanimate objects. Someday. Yeah. We'll fund it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So on the macro scale, the tendency of galaxies to form spirals, does that have anything to do with the tendency of particles to mm -hmm. form these vortexes? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question about um, galaxy patterns. And, and right, I mean, there's probably definitely something more universal than about these types of patterns since we see them elsewhere, that kind of swirling behavior. So uh, yes, I mean, we can think of that on some level as just, you know, if you zoom out enough, right, those um, solar systems or galaxies are just kind of colliding with each other. It's just like some collection of grains, and you, you shake them, and you get some pattern to emerge. Arietta and Jessica, you know, the natu natural science, well, you're natural science, too. <laughs> you think of this, I mean, you see purpose in why those birds are flocking as an ecologist at some level. Jessica sees homostasis, I mean, but, but we're always seeking that, that it's more purposeful. Do you have anything to say to Ryan? I wonder what these <laughs> molecules are made out of, because I think it's uh, Coulomb's law is playing a, a role in there, attractive and repulsive and a balance of those. So can you make your mm -hmm. molecules out of anything and see that pattern, or do they have to be certain mm, properties to, to let you see that? Uh, right, so there's different, I guess, different types of active matter. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the, like, one of the examples I showed was just little round disks. And you put some chemical which will slowly dissolve, and that will cause it to just randomly move. So um, is that due to the diffusion, though, or is that due to the thing moving? Yeah. Well, it's, it's due to evaporation of the chemical mm -hmm. out. But maybe, maybe, let me take the other example, like the first movie of the swarming. Um, can I play it? So it is, it's, oh, let's see. Uh, the red one? Yeah, I mean, because that one is just um, little, like elliptical disks, which are on a bed of spheres, and then just vibrated. Mm -hmm. So the only reason you get flocking is that because there's some polarity, right? There's that they're not uh, not uniform. Right? It's just some directionality. So you're like, packing and unpacking and lattices. Yeah. That's what I see. I see molecules interacting and bouncing off. But these are large. These are like macro scale. Two millimeters? Yeah, a few millimeters. What about you, Ariad? Um, this, this, so the idea of these emergent behaviors, it actually overlaps mm -hmm. with my right. fields a lot. Um, I think the way biologists often use them, though, is from sort of a statistics perspective, this is our sort of null to compare things to, right? So if we, we think the birds are doing something on purpose, we need to show that they're doing something more than what random molecules would do, right? And if they don't, then we probably can't say that they are, right? And so, so we, we, I think the way a lot of biologists use these models is more as having a baseline to compare to than an interest in these emergent properties themselves. That's, that's my take on it. Would bubbles be considered active matter? Uh, bubbles? Yeah. Because um, they, I guess because they pop? Well, or, I, I'm, you know, they have patterns and they, they have behaviors. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, they, they do move around, I mean, because they, they kind of pop randomly. And um, yeah, physicists have studied that, like how the randomness of bubble poppings. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking of surf. Uh, is there, you know, I mean, I'm talking big bubbles, <laughs> lots of bubbles. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, anything that's, you know, well, for most people, I think active matter would, would mean that constituent units are like, consuming energy in some fashion, and, and that's causing them to move. Uh, but it could well, be through, like, the currents yeah. of the ocean, right? And that's causing them to move, and you could look at, like, the, the swirling patterns you would get as if bubbles were all... Yeah. On the ocean. And they definitely release energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was wondering 
toxoplasmosis qualifies as a zombie disease because if I remember correctly, like mm -hmm. it doesn't kill the host, but it makes, at least in mice, them more likely to get caught. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It, it manipulates their behavior in a way that's favorable for the, for the parasite. So humans can get toxoplasmosis, so they can also become zombies. We, we can get toxoplasmosis, and there is some work looking at effects on humans, um, but nothing very conclusive yet. Um, it's mostly population-level studies looking at general rates of toxoplasmosis and personality traits. So there's some some people think that it correlates with um, like extroversion specifically, um, but. The work's not quite there yet. <laughs> so. oh, Chris, you a question? Oh, Alina? Yes, I don't want to keep pushing these connections between stuff and um, philosophical things, but I mean, first of all, you, your films are going to haunt my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> things seem to happen. And maybe you think about Schopenhauer's view that everything in the world is just this blind will to live, fighting with other wills to, to live meaninglessly, just pushing forward. Um, is that, I mean, did you, again, I want to raise the same question I go, go to write. Does this give you a particular metaphysical view of the, the world that you research these things that have such a a sort of nightmarish, will-like character to them. Um, I'm not sure that it influences my metaphysical perspective. Um, I think I th I think I think of it more as sort of these building blocks, right? Like you could say for any particular organism, like this will to live is what's driving these patterns, right? But it's not. It doesn't reduce to that, right, solely. So that's sort of how I would, would see this, right? Um, yes, I haven't shown um, disease videos to non-scientists in quite a while. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I, I'm sort of not answering. <laughs> no, it was just the expression of where I was in my horrified brain. <laughs> is, is there one more question from anyone here? Well, look, I just want to say thank you so much. It was really a wonderful addition to our series. Thank you all so very much.